Thank you very much. Thank you, Ritz, for the invitation. It's great to be here. I guess um, you'll see that I scratched duality in my title. That should give you an idea that this is somewhat of a recycled talk. Uh, but I found out that if I slice it correctly, it had perfect topics for, for this workshop. So there's definitely a lot of Julia in it. Uh, there's some uh, matrix calculus. Uh, there's definitely interplay between computation and mathematics. Uh, but there's another kind of like topic that it fits, which is non-math, non-computational, which is more like maybe I will call like sort of student-driven research. So as, as a, uh, I, I, it's true that it, we were kind of, a, that a, you could say there was an early adopter of Julia, but it wasn't really me, it was my students that actually were the early adopters. And they started, so my first two PhD students at MIT and another PhD student started uh, working on building a mathematical uh, mo uh, modeling language on top of, of Julia. And I was using it for research as well, so it was going well, but it started kind of like picking up its sort of own life. And it was kind of like going away from my comfort zone. Uh, but, and then I was like, well, but what do I do? And things were going well. So Alan was very encouraging. of like, look, if great things are happening, just like don't get in the way, be supportive and uh, we'll figure it out. And in the end, like, we got a big grant to actually support Jump. So everything worked out really nicely. And I think uh, this is kind of a like similar story of Julia of like, uh, great things happen when you just encourage people. And, um, and in fact, this is, a, I guess, a, this is the, the talk is uh, co authored with like, uh, two PhD students that are not the ones from uh, Jump. So I guess these are my second and third PhD students uh, at MIT who are already graduated. And uh, they definitely did a lot of the work that I'm going to be talking about. Um, so I mentioned that like, uh, Jump is a modeling language. So let me clarify it as like, I guess like a modeling language for mathematical optimization. And what is the goal of that is uh, trying to convert an optimization problem uh, from the way that we write it in math to a uh, code in the computer that hopefully looks as similar or as close to the actual uh, problem that I want to solve uh, as possible. Uh, so you can see here, Basically, I wrote down a very, very simple, uh, in this case, integer programming problem. I'm trying to solve uh, a knapsack problem. Uh, and this is essentially the Julia code in Jump that models it. And you can see, well, the, the sum looks very similar to the uh, sum that I would actually write in code. Um, and the modeling language includes the, this, this programming language, but also the interface on how to actually uh, feed all this input to a solver, get solutions back, and, and other sort of like a, issues with the software ecosystem. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about most today about is like a, a little bit of Jump and how Jump can be used for different things, but mostly how Jump can be used to model, to go a little bit more from things that look more linear to things that are more nonlinear to more nonlinear optimization problems, particular convex optimization problems. And I guess there was a question about Julia. Is like, maybe I'll ask anybody that is used to Julia finds anything strange about this code? Oh, I, I, I'm familiar for Julia code, let's say. It's actually the evaluation of Boolean, I think, on the zero, it's zero index. It's zero index based. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, this is completely on purpose. I would say, so like lately I've been coding and for the last few years uh, since I've been then I've been coding mostly in C++ and Python, almost no Julia whatsoever. And so it was a shock to move from one indexing to zero indexing. But it was okay. I wasn't sort of like it wasn't too terrible. I got, uh, I was not uh, sort of missing it too much. But I did miss the linear algebra first class in Julia. So like a lot of the talks going to be about this. But this also is a perfect segue for my Alan anecdote. Uh, so like I was very happy to. So Alan, I guess, I guess tweeted maybe three times or four times. And uh, happy to be have been one of the ones that helped uh, get the first tweet. So Tawhid was a colleague at Sloan, and we were actually using Julia for optimization problems. And he was presenting, and everybody was really happy because it was uh, basically like we were doing these like fantasy football, and and you could actually win with fantasy football using integer programming and Julia. But the students, for some reason, didn't like the zero indexing. So he tweeted this, and like Alan just answered about the I don't know who was the actual colleague that came up with the Solomon-esque uh, solution of half indexing. Uh, but I guess like my code, like the original code was actually one index, and I just went and changed it to zero indexing, and it just works. So like, if you want to use zero indexing in Julia, you definitely can. There's no issue whatsoever. I remember there's like, I think Viral had a question, like some answer that you could do any indexing arbitrary, but if you want to zero, you can just change it. I heard a question maybe. 
Nope. You're going to drive yourself insane. I mean, half indexing. Well, I mean, it's just sets. It's like, and, and I guess like uh, the other thing that I did is like, uh, well, you can always just like uh, try to use matrices and linear algebra, and then it's like, listen, really, the indices are not even there, which I guess will come up, come back in the, later in the talk as well. Okay, so let me start like with the real kind of like talk. So first, let me just tell you about a little bit more about jump. Uh, so it was started again was like a, here are the three students that started the jumping, uh, and uh, it kind of grew. So this was I think when I forgot when maybe when Ian was graduating, uh, the, the picture was taken, and I guess it's. Yeah, it's somewhere between 2013, maybe it was released in 2016, like the first actual public version, but it, like it was very on, early on that we started working on this. And now it's grown, it's like a fairly uh, big community. Uh, the jump supports various different solvers for optimization problems. I think I had 35 plus, and I went to the state of jump uh, talk uh, this morning, so yes, no, uh, yesterday morning, and it was already up to 41, so I had to update the slides. <laughs> Um, and it keeps growing. Uh, we've had we had like some nice workshops uh, since the pandemic. We started having the workshops co-located with uh, JulieCon virtually, and this is the first time we have like an in-person uh, workshop after uh, a lot of time. So it's actually been been great, and it's fairly mature now. I would say it took a while to get to 1.0, but now it is 1.0. So I think it's like ready for prime time. You should be uh, uh, happy. It's like you can use it with things that are. You don't want to have to be changing things. There's not going to be breaking changes, and it's fairly sustainable. We have this grant that is that is funding it, but it's also through Num Focus, which is like an, an organization that allows you to kind of have like like a, a fiscal sponsorship, so that you can have a little bit more more stability on the on the project. Um, so that's about Jump, and most of Jump. Uh, I mean, most of the problems have our optimization model with linear objectives and linear inequalities, but many problems actually also are have nonlinear inequalities. And so it becomes a little bit tricky to decide on, well, if I want to write linear inequalities, it's sort of like there's not a lot of different ways to write down linear inequality. But if I want to write down some convex constraint, there's many different ways of writing it. So for instance, maybe it's a level set of a nonlinear function that, that you have written in a given way, and, and some solvers allow you to just have these functions to be anything. It could be Julia code, then you can apply automatic differentiation, and that's how you get the gradients or Hessians, and the solver just works. And so at least one, one solver that is very, very uh, effective and widely used for this. But there's a problem that in some sense when you have this black box or even gray box, even if they give you the expression of the of the, of the function, I might lose some of the structure of the set or the function. In particular, uh, the things that have to do with like a, maybe the linear algebra or like matrix structure associated to uh, the function. So one way, one alternative is to try to model things differently where this structure is actually more apparent and can be exploited for modeling, but also for having solvers that are even more effective than if you just like, tackle the functions directly. And this will like come with a little bit of a teaser of like some matrix calculus. I guess it's not sure how much time I'm going to have to go over that. It's like always not great to be the last talk before lunch. So I'll leave it as a, a little bit of a teaser so you can follow after that. So what's the sort of this paradigm that I'm the, that is like a, one paradigm that allows you to kind of have more of the matrix or like linear algebra structure in your problem and keep it is conic optimization. And basically, what it does is uh, a traditional linear optimization problem will, ma will let's say, maximize or minimize a linear function subject to an affine function of the variables being on the non-negative orthogonal, for instance, or being equal to zero, which will be equality constraints. Uh, conic optimization basically says, well, you didn't really need to pick the non-negative orthogonal or the non-negative ray. You could pick any closed convex cone. And traditional cones are usually things like, uh, like the perhaps the most interesting or illustrative one of what conic optimization can do is the Lorentz cone or the second order cone or the ice cream cone, which clearly is sort of like the simplest nonlinear, uh, non polyhedral cone that you can have. Uh, but you can also have some things that are more interesting, like uh, the cone of positive semi definite matrices, which is very powerful to model different types of problems and to actually also, uh, it, it could be very useful. To, get, to design effective algorithms for solving these problems. And another cone that is also very common is, or like let's say in the last couple or three years, is the exponential cone. Uh, basically because if you want things with logs on exponentials, uh, you can't really approximate them well with semi-definite constraints or things that are sort of quadratic. So people kind of brought in this extra cone that allows you to do logarithms and, 
and exponentials. Um, and these are, I would say, like their standard cones because they're the ones that are supported by most solvers. But you could have other cones. Um, we actually look at a long list of cones. So perhaps one interesting one is the uh, geometric mean cone. If you actually look at the hypergraph of the geometric mean, it is a uh, it is a cone, and you could actually work with that cone also for modeling purposes. Let's say you could write down this cone also by combining these cones with some recipes, but you could also potentially use it directly. And I'll give you an example of what I mean by these recipes and how hard they are. <laughs> um, so again, what's the advantage of uh, of doing this conic approach instead of actually writing these nonlinear functions? is that you kind of preserve a little bit of the rich structure, which uh, through the algorithms actually gives you more effective uh, solvers. Um, not just for the linear case, it also is very useful for the uh, mixed integer conic optimization. So that's how I actually started. I, I did integer programming. I'm, I'm not really a convex optimization person, uh, but then it was kind of natural to go from mixed integer linear to mixed integer nonlinear, and conic already there was actually helping a lot. Uh, and that's sort of how, how I actually ended up working with this. The disadvantage of the conic optimization is that you now, if you had your functions already, you now need some recipes to translate things into these uh, forms. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, and the problem is that, again, solvers only support a handful of cones. So if you already had a cone that you really liked and it's not on the solver, you need to try to convert it into the ones that are supported. Um, as I mentioned, I wasn't really doing uh, like. Uh, Convex optimization, I was doing mixed integer, linear programming, and then I ended up in this. And part of the reason that like, I kind of like was okay with getting into this was thanks to Julia. Kind of Julia made it easy to experiment and try things without actually being an expert and sort of slowly become an expert and learn about things. And so like when I, uh, my 2020 keynote at JuliaCon, uh, my party message was, Julia makes you bald. You should try to use, uh, you should try, new, it allows you to try new math. Uh, before learning it, but it shouldn't be an excuse not to learn it, but to actually learn it. You shouldn't get to stay there. And I try to do that, and I guess this, we started doing conic optimization because this two, two students that are co-authored this talk kind of said like, we want uh, the current solvers are not uh, great, we should make a new solver. And I'm like, I have no experience on this, but we're gonna do it in Julia, let's just try to see what happens. And I did end up learning a little bit of the math, maybe not all of it, but I would say like, maybe at least you can let the students learn the, so they definitely learned about the about this stuff that I'm gonna be talking about. And then teach it to you. And then teach it to me, yes. And it was great, and then I just like made sure that it was like the, uh, basically forced them to dump down the paper to the level that I could understand it, and <laughs> which ended up being a good thing. So. Um, so the recipes, so there's, it depends on how, I, you could argue that the recipes are complicated or not, so I'll, instead of arguing in favor, I'm just gonna give you a couple examples. Here's a very, very simple example. Uh, your only nonlinear function is entropy, so, but it's fairly tame nonlinear function. And let's say I tell you that you need to write down as a conic optimization problem, and you can use all the cones, but in, in particular, I'm gonna even make your life easier, I'm gonna tell you you need to use only that exponential cone that I defined. How you do it, well, it's not completely evident. You need to do a little bit of transformations, but it's fairly simple to realize what I need to do, like a massage to get, the, uh, to, to get the problem in a conic form. And in particular, what I actually ended up doing was, I actually picked a slice of the cone. So, and this is kind of like gonna be the, uh, a typical thing. Once you get that, that is sort of the hard part of figuring it out, it's not too terrible. Now you can write down your, your optimization problem in conic form. And one key aspect is that you will need to add some auxiliary variables to your problem to be able to model it. And in this case, it's only a few scalar variables, so it's not too expensive, it's not too terrible. So, so far, not a lot of work. How do I put this into jump? Could be potentially very annoying. Fortunately, it is not that much more than what you actually would do in the linear part, so all the linear constraints kind of look the same. And this constraint that says some of the variables belong to a cone, you can write it down exactly the same way that you would. As long as this exponential cone is supported by jump. And it is, and in fact it is supported by many solvers as well. So not too terrible. So hopefully this is like, yeah, okay, I can do that. It can get a little bit more annoying when you start doing more complicated things. So here's fairly classical uh, problem of uh, uh, experimental design. Uh, if you're familiar with it, you will know. If you're not familiar with it, the only thing I'll kind of like interesting to, to note is basically 
This is trying to design an experiment of doing linear regression with uh, querying different points. And basically this matrix that I'm building up here is, so this is basically the question that I'm, that I'm doing and uh, how many times I'm adding the question. This is a matrix and this matrix, its inverse is essentially the covariance matrix of the estimator of my linear regression. So what this problem is trying to do is like picking the covariance matrix, sort of scalarizing in some way with the, with the log determinant and trying to minimize the variance to design uh, an experiment that will give me the best linear regression with regards to minimum, minimum variance. How do I model that now in uh, conic optimization? Well, it gets a little bit more complicated. Uh, if I use the sum of cone, I can do it. And together with the exponential cone, I can write down something that is not terribly complicated, but now I have a lot more auxiliary variables besides some scalar auxiliary variables that have this matrix uh, of variables that might actually make the problem grow significantly. My original variables were only these, how many times I do the experiments. Now I needed to add these, build these matrices that are gonna go into the solver and make all the internal linear algebra a lot harder to do. But you can do it and I guess it is polynomial, everything works out okay, uh, but it can really kill you in particular with memory. So the question is, can we do a little bit better? And the uh, sort of first step on trying to do it better is, this was kind of like a clean, I can do it. Could I actually have something shorter and cleaner and have like a better cone? And I can by maybe adding a new cone. So what I can actually do is, uh, the same way as I, if you look at this cone over here, it was I basically picked the exponential function, the epigraph of the exponential function, and homogenized it, and made a cone, I, I picked the cone that it was generated by this. You can do the same trick with the log determinant. Now this is a function that gets a matrix and gives me the output of scalar, and I still add a scalar function to try to do this, uh, this, this trick, and I now get a cone, which if I actually picked a slice of this cone, I get the function that I wanted. So it's fairly simple to actually go and reformulate the problem. And I can see that basically I just picked a function, did the homogenization, the same trick of picking that sort of slice, and now I actually have a conic optimization problem. How do I go from this to jump? Fairly easy, because jump actually supports the log determinant cone. Uh, the only thing I really needed to do here was like, there's a little bit of space. I, I basically formed the matrix over here, this matrix inside here. I basically did a little bit extra thing to pick the upper triangle part of the matrix and just like make it a vector. And if I pick that thing and tell uh, jump, that thing has to be inside the triangle. In particular, it's like not just that vector, but the concatenation of T1 and the representation of the matrix in that flattened vectorized way. That's all I needed to do. And I can solve, and if I solve it with like a, uh, various different solvers, it will work. If the solver supports this cone directly, it can use it. If not, jump basically will do all these other steps that I showed you automatically because the nice thing about the recipes that are sort of mechanical. You usually can just combine the rules fairly simple and just like get things done. Might not be the best one, but jump does a very good job on trying to make it efficient. Uh, and jump now recognize over more than 20 cones of matrices and vectors so you can easily play with them and, and, uh, and again, we'll do these, all these transformations automatically. So it does help you having these extra cones kind of like lowers the burden of actually having to build models. So the next question is, well, if I have more cones, could it potentially get better solves? So the interesting thing here is, or compared to this problem, is I had all these auxiliary variables that are actually making all the linear systems that I need to solve bigger versus here where I keep the dimension being the same as the original problem. <laughs> Can I try to use that or exploit it? And the answer is, depends on basically this object, or basically the, uh, so the, the solvers for interior point, for, for contact optimization are, the most effective ones are primal dual interior point methods. Uh, I will not go in detail like exactly how they work, but one thing that they need is they need one object associated to the cone to be able to be effective, which is a logarithmic homogeneous self-concordant barrier. So there's two components of this. One is the logarithmic homogeneous barrier for the cone. That part is it's fairly easy. Uh, the barrier for the non-negative ray is minus log. And basically being a barrier means exactly, well, if you try to go outside the cone, you're going to infinity, it's a barrier. Uh, the logarithmic homogeneous is, well, you're homogeneous like log. So it's also pretty straightforward and generalized as to other sets. Self-concordant is a little bit tricky. Uh, basically is 
uh, we can see the matrix calculus starting to pop up. It is basically some condition, the function needs to be C3, and it has to have some relation between the third order derivatives and the second order derivatives. And I will not go into details on why this makes uh, things work, but it makes things work. It, makes, it, it allows you to kind of predict what Newton method's gonna do inside the solver. So if you can have a, a barrier with this property, then you'll be able to solve the problem effectively. So that's sort of the algorithm. How does this translate to solver? Well, what the students wanted to do was, can we write a solver that will generically get a barrier? If somebody gives me a barrier for the cone, can I just use that generically? And if somebody brings down a barrier, it'll work. And that's basically Hypatia, which is a solver written, an interior point solver written in Julia. And uh, it's pure Julia. Uh, you can plug in any barrier. If it's not logarithmic homogeneous, maybe you're lucky and the thing converges, but there's no guarantees. But it can work. But also we actually have like, again, uh, more than 20 predefined cones where we know that the barrier was uh, logarithmic homogeneous. And I would say like up to the writing the solver, everything was like, oh yes, this is just writing down. Again, we didn't really need to know if the barrier was homogeneous or not. Logarithmic, sorry, sorry, if the barrier was uh, self-concordant or not. It was just coding, so it's great. But then of course the students are like, well, I wonder if this barrier that we came up with is self-concordant. And I guess that was the whole, uh, the, the, a whole diversion into trying to understand this matrix calculus with, uh, with matrices, and it, you'll see it, get, it, it got a little crazy at some point. So in the, I guess, like last five minutes, I'm just gonna give you a teaser of what was the math behind this thing. And the motivation, one possible motivation is, I mentioned this matrix over here is the covariance matrix, and we wanna scalarize it some way. The log that scalarization was basically, well, let's pick the eigenvalues and let's take the uh, sum of the logs of the eigenvalues. That was one way of scalarizing. But there's other ways of scalarizing the eigenvalues. So the natural way of doing that is basically, if I have any function that is uh, uh, on the non-negative uh, ray, I can actually just apply that function to the uh, eigenvalues to get a, what is uh, basically a separable spectral function of the matrix. Uh, for instance, I could do sort of like entropy instead of minus log, I could do minus square root. And if we do that, basically for any one of these functions, you can actually figure out what the uh, barrier is for this problem. This is basically like if you wanted to write a barrier for this thing and this was your, you probably like a first or second guess would be this. You wouldn't know if it's self-concordant, but we managed to prove that it was actually self-concordant. And the nice thing is that the way that Hypatia works is this uh, sp spectral function depends on this small function that you're adding. Basically, Hypatia can, has a cone that is parameterized that way. You actually just say, well, my cone is gonna be this epic of the perspective of spectral cone. What are the parameters? Basically, I need to write down what is that function that I'm doing. In this case, minus log. Uh, I just need to give a couple of oracles that describe the function. And I could do it in matrices. I could do it also in vectors, permission matrices, but actually the fun math happened because you could actually do this in an Euclidean Jordan, and a sum of squares of an Euclidean Jordan algebra, and everything worked. And the fun thing was, I would say, doing that abstraction made everything much easier because it was almost writing down the same thing you did with matrices, but it actually, without having to necessarily say matrix, it was a little bit abstract, and, and I was like, that's one of the things that allowed me to understand what was going on a little bit easier, or at least to verify that everything was working correctly. So that's, I guess, the, uh, the uh, most of my talk. Uh, I guess the, the teaser is partly, uh, instead of actually rereading re re the paper, I'm kind of trying to hope that you will want to read the paper again. So I'll tell you a little bit like what are the interesting things to find there. So in the paper that we wrote uh, with, uh, with my students, uh, we also talked about, so, so we looked at separable spectral functions, but I didn't define what a convex separable spectral function is. Uh, that is in the paper, but what we did was more looking at the, that the derivatives of the function were matrix monotope, which kind of are the matrix convexity and matrix monotonicity are the natural generalizations of the scalar versions. Uh, we also looked at functions that were not necessarily separable. So they're functions of the eigenvalues, but they're not sum of functions of the eigenvalues. It's more complicated. And one example is the root determinant of the, of the matrix. And uh, it was like this recent paper that actually extended the from matrix monotone derivatives to matrix convex derivatives. And again, it has some 
some interesting things is there's some interest represent, integral representations of what a matrix convex and matrix monotone functions are. So there's, a, again, more interesting uh, calculus. And uh, finally, I, I'm advocating for conic, but that doesn't mean that jump is not only doing conic. There's also a lot of work going on on actually integrating more nonlinear functions because sometimes it's actually, this is a natural way of writing things and some solvers can work with them, so we're trying to improve that. And with that, I guess, so just stop and see if there's questions. Any questions? Okay, iPhone. Uh, do you regret using Julia? <laughs> <sighs> do I regret using Julia? Yes. Not really, because. But there were pains. Hmm? There were pains of using Julia. Ah. Before one point zero, I think Jump had a lot of churn. Before Julia one point zero. I think it was like. It was like, because if you're doing research, it didn't really, it's like, I didn't, I didn't really, like, yeah, if you don't know what you really were trying to do, it's like, as things change, it's like, uh, oh, my idea has changed from last week, so if the code changed, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> I think now, okay, now that I'm doing more production code, I would be, uh, I, can, I can see why people would get mad at the beginning with Julia, but I definitely didn't feel the pain at all. So uh, one of the reasons I'm really excited to see a pure Julia interior point conic optimization solver mm -hmm. is because I like to sometimes do things beyond double precision floats. Oh. So is that smooth now all the way to jump? Not 100% all the way to jump, but I think it should be in the next release to jump because Hypatia, well, everything is, you can do exact, like any precision you want. It was just that you couldn't write down that through jump and now jump allows you to do uh, any precision, so let's say if the solver supports rationals even, let's say for linear optimization, you just define a jump model that is parameterized by rationals. And I think that should be out, I, I promised jump 1.0 for like three years, but I think, <laughs> let's say, I, I think I, I, in a couple of months at most, I would think this should be released. It should, I, I, if I understood correctly, the, the, yesterday morning they said it was like a, about to be merged, maybe even this week, so. Okay, right. I've done it before for linear programming with convex calling tulip, but for uh, semi-definite programs, I really want it in tulip testing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess I get. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure we try with rationals. I don't know what's going to happen there. Uh, but at least with like big floats or things yeah. like yeah, that. Yeah, big floats would yeah. be great. Thank you. And that's back for dinner, uh, lunch. <laughs>